Hey, welcome to our NSLA webinar on classroom management in the school library. We are going to look at um, some pretty specific areas on classroom management in the school library today. The three that we will talk about um, are building relationships, establishing clear and consistent procedures and routines, and those we'll spend a little bit more time on than the other areas. And then finally, knowing when to stick with it, start over and ask for help. So the first area we're going to look at is building relationships. And as an educator, um, we all know that building relationships is one of the key things that we need um, to have a successful school library program. And one of those things is helping with our classroom management in our libraries. We're going to start out with, you know, just getting to know the teachers and the school support staff in your building. That is incredibly critical because they are the people who spend the most time with your students and know your students probably um, a little bit better than you do um, in some respects because they do work with them more frequently. Um, they'll be able to tell you what interventions are already in place for students, um, what strategies might work well in their classrooms, maybe some things that have happened in that student's life that are causing um, some difficulties for them. Um, and maybe, you know, just, just some issues that you may not be aware of because you are not the classroom teacher. So be sure to reach out to those folks if you see that there may be some issues or problems with some kiddos in your room um, when they're in there for library and see if there's anything that you should know to help them with that. Um, if you have any students who are um, in special education, talk with their case managers, see if there's anything that you should know in addition to the IEP information maybe some things that they're working on specifically with those students could help them out in your area as well. And once you have gotten kind of the information from your staff, it's really important to get to know your students themselves on a personal level. Um, having that connection with them can really reduce some of the issues and problems you may see um, with behaviors or attention in your classroom. Um, and your classroom is your school library. So talk with your students as much as you can. Um, get to know them, see them, um, maybe doing some things outside of your school library. Um, go to building events, go to community events. If you know that they're in sports or in um, music productions of the school, ask them about how those things are going in their life. Um, that may be a connection that you can have with them. You can also, while they're standing in line waiting for their teacher, or they're getting ready to get packed up, walk around and talk to them and say, you know, how, how's your week going? Did you like the book you checked out? Um, what are you looking forward to this week at school? Um, how's your sibling doing? Um, if you know that they've talked about getting a new pet in the family, maybe follow up and ask about that. Um, but just kind of getting to know what they like and do outside of school can help as well. Um, it'll give you a, something to talk about for sure. Uh, and that builds that rapport with the students that, that goes up um, each time that you see them and every time that they visit the library. Um, and getting to know them really does pay off in the long run. Students with the greatest behavior problems often need the most attention and not just in a disciplinary way. Um, spending time on positive student interaction can have really long range constructive conse consequences, like constructive consequences. Um, so be sure that you take that time to get to know those students. Um, you may have heard it referred to as a two by 10, um, where you spend, um, two minutes, 10 times with the student, getting to know them and focusing on those students who really um, maybe need your attention during the day. Um, the next part is looking at clear and consistent procedures and routines. So this is something that we all know is critical when we work with students and it's, a challenge sometimes when you're on 
a rotating cycle schedule with students so that maybe you only see them, you know, here and there um, as opposed to every day. Or if you're with secondary students where you only see them when they happen to be with their class in the library. So having those clear and consistent procedures and routines with those students becomes pretty vital um, so that they know what the expectations are when they're in your room and those expectations are what they are. Um, and there's a couple of things to think about specifically in a school library setting that you may not have to think about in other classrooms. Um, but the first thing kind of applies to everybody. Know and follow your building guidelines. Are there specific things that your building leadership expects every teacher to follow? Is there a school specific attention getter? Um, is there something that you're supposed to do to get students back on track and focused on the lesson? Um, are students allowed to go to the restroom during specials? This kind of comes up um, more frequently than you would think. Have they just gone to the bathroom on the way to you? Um, is there a lanyard that they're supposed to take? Do they have to have a paper pass? How does that work? Um, how do you keep track of who's gone and who can go and when they can go? Um, is there a specific way that they're supposed to line up or transition when they go from room to room? Um, sometimes there's a procedure for that that's in place. Um, do they have to hold their bodies in a specific way? Um, is it a safe hold where they cross their arms and hug um, their hands to their opposite arm? Is there a door holder? Is there a line leader? How does that work? Just following those procedures can help quite a bit because that keeps them in their normal routine. Um, and then what are the consequences if a student doesn't follow directions? What is it that your building leadership would like you to do? Is there a safe seat? Is there a buddy system? Is there um, some sort of procedure that students go through before um, the set of consequences get um, maybe to that administrator level? At what point do you contact the teacher or administrator um, or security for improper behavior? How, how do they want that handled? So knowing what those things are, again, can help things go a little bit more smoothly for you. And then as we get to more of the library specific things, um, these kind of seem like things that most people know, but I think that there's lots of different ways to look at it. And one of the things is where and how do students sit when they come into your library? Is there a specific place that they're supposed to go every single time? So do you start out on a reading rug in elementary school? Do you start out at tables? Are there assigned seats? Um, I'm a big proponent for assigned seats because, first of all, it helps you get to know who those students are a little bit easier um, when they have an assigned seat. When you have the whole school that you're working with, no matter whether you're in elementary school or secondary school, um, you can have assigned seats for students. And really, I just let them know up front that this is a way for me to call on you by name um, so I can get to know who you are. And it's not a punishment in any way. It's just a way to help me get to know who you are. So we had assigned seats um, even at the high school. I had a template where the teachers could fill out either for the computer lab or for our tables um, who was sitting where so I could work with those students and call them by name. We have elementary teachers who assign specific spots on their reading rug and then specific spots at their tables. Um, so those things can definitely be of benefit and assistance. Um, how do they sit when they go to the reading rug? Do we sit on our pockets and put our hands in our lap? When we go to the table, um, depending on what kind of chairs you have, how do we sit in our chairs? <coughs> Pardon my coughing. Um, what is that specific procedure for when they come and sit? And going over that multiple times with them can be very helpful. Do you have um, a point where students can pick their assigned seats once you know their name? Um, is that something that you can get to down the road? 
Another thing to think about is labeling where students sit. So we'll have people who um, I've seen really cool stuff that they've done where in the middle of each table there's something that designates that table. So I've seen emojis, I've seen Candyland pieces, I've seen um, different colors or different shapes or things like that. So when a teacher is addressing a table, they can address the purple table or they can address the cowboy table or they can address um, uh, the, pardon me, the puppy dog table or something like that. So as they're talking to different groups, they can address the tables that way. Um, you can also label your computers. So having specific numbers on the computers so students know where to go or having different shapes or colors or something, stickers on the computer monitor can be helpful as well. Um, having those table labels makes it very easy to dismiss, um, to, to go to different areas or different activities or to check out or when they're lining up. Um, for example, if you're in the computer lab and you have those little stickers on your computers, you can say, hey, everybody with the star sticker, please get in line. Everybody with the heart sticker, please get in line. Um, and then it makes it go a little bit less chaotic if they're dismissed in small groups. Um, how are you going to handle check-in? Um, what do students do with their books? Do they go into a milk crate and someone brings a milk crate down to you at the beginning of the day? When students come into the library, do they go on a cart? And if they go on a cart, do you have a cart for your everyone books and a cart for your fiction books and a cart for your nonfiction books? So that students kind of self put these on the carts for you to help with shelving later on. Do students check their own books in when they come into the library? I've seen that done before too. Um, there's lots of different ways to make that happen. So think about your library space, what you feel like your teachers are able to do, and what will be of benefit to you later on as you go to shelve or someone um, who is assisting you maybe is going to shelve those books. So think about how that can happen. Um, students can very easily differentiate between which cart their books need to go on. Um, so there's ways that you can do that to kind of make it a little easier for you. And then think about um, what if they want to renew their book? Do they hold on to it and bring it up at checkout? Um, if they have forgotten their book in their desk or their locker, how do they go and get their book? Is that something that they're allowed to do or do they have to wait till later in the day? Um, what is that procedure in your building? So again, just kind of thinking about the logistics of how that's all gonna work. And then we get to check out. Um, I've seen a lot of instances where uh, students in a class of, you know, like 25 to 30 are all out trying to check out books at the shelves at the same time. And that can be challenging when you're one librarian who's trying to manage 30 people who want your attention and help finding things. And then they're all kind of lined up waiting to check out. Um, that lineup can, can be a recipe for some shenanigans going on in the library for sure. Um, when you have a bunch of small folks or even older folks kind of lined up waiting to do something, um, they get a little fidgety. So think about how you can maybe um, do your checkout where you're sending them in small groups from their tables or from their um, different spaces in the library. So giving, you know, 25, 30 minutes to check out, depending on how long your um, class period is, um, five minutes for each group, or if you have a shorter amount of time, maybe you send two groups at a time and give them five minutes. But this way you can get more personalized attention for the people who are looking for books. And the other people at the tables could be doing a follow-up to a lesson that you've taught. They could be working with makerspace activities. They could be writing a summary of a story that you've read or illustrating maybe the setting for the story that you've read if they're not able to write full sentences yet. There's many activities that they can do for 10, 15, 20 minutes while they're waiting for their turn or when they're done checking out their books. So think about how you can keep that instruction going while also giving students the opportunity to check out in those small groups. 
and think about how many books you know students can check out at a time making sure that they understand and know that um, what do they do if they have a book missing how do you make sure they're still able to check out even though maybe they forgot something at home um, really the the key to this is just making sure that students understand what the expectations are during checkout how they can get help and what they can and cannot check out at that time um, with technology if you're working at all with technology how do students access the device um, really going through that with them multiple times on this is how we log in or this is how we turn it on this is how we use the machine um, or the device. <clears throat> um, what do they do when they're supposed to be listening to directions? I've seen people have students turn off the screen. I've seen people flip a piece of paper over so they're not distracted by what's in front of them. Um, I've also seen people go step by step and walk around and make sure people are on the screen that they're supposed to be on. That's something that I would do in the high school classroom in our lab is I would be able to walk behind them and see who was where they needed to be on the screen so they could follow along. And then what do they do when they're finished? Where should their keyboard or their mouse or their headphones go when they're done? Um, do they push in their chairs and stay behind it and wait to be called to get lined up? Um, what happens when they're not following directions and they're not on the right screen or not doing what they're supposed to be doing? What is the procedure for that? And then chatter. <laughs> um, I am a big proponent of libraries not being silent spaces. Um, they should be, have the sounds of learning in them. So it shouldn't be a completely silent space, but it also shouldn't be um, so noisy that students aren't able to get done what they need to do. So, um, there's a couple of different ways to look at that. I've seen people use apps that let students like visually see up on a screen kind of what their volume level is so they can self-regulate. Um, I've seen people use a chart that kind of does the same thing and say, okay, this is what a zero voice is. This is a one, a two, and a three. And let's say during um, reading time, your voice should be at a zero unless I call on you. Um, but maybe during Table activities, your volume can be at a two, like an inside voice. So just being very clear as to what the volume level is and when it's appropriate to talk and when it isn't. And a lot of times for, um, doesn't matter what age student, what are the procedures if I want to share some information or ask a question? Um, and um, that can be challenging for some of our, some of our kiddos. <clears throat> and then lining up. Um, doesn't seem like it would be a big deal, but it kind of is, um, even at the secondary level. So when we're done, what do we do? Um, some teachers have students line up in ABC order, or they each are assigned a number in their classroom, and they line up by number order. If there's no procedure for that, you could have students line up by their birth month. You could ask them their favorite fruit, and say, okay, everyone who likes apples, line up. Everyone who likes bananas, everyone who likes grapes. And then they can line up in their different um, ways that way, or what's their favorite type of pet, or their favorite sport to play or watch, or what their favorite color is. And this is another really good way to get to know your students so that you are not um, just having them line up. Um, in a, in a general way or by gender, um, but you can get to know them a little bit there as well. So those are just some uh, consistent procedures and routines to think about as you're working with students in your school libraries. And then finally, <laughs> knowing when to stick with it, start over or ask for help. So this is the hard part. So establishing those consistent procedures and routines. So when things don't go well the first or second time, it's really easy to say to yourself, oh, this is just not working. I need to change what I'm doing. But at the same time, we need to think about 
the fact that your students don't see you every day. And it may be a couple of weeks before you've seen them, you know, a handful of times. And it takes a little while for those procedures to sink in. And what you're asking them to do may be slightly different than what their classroom teacher asks them to do. So getting used to what you want versus what their classroom teachers want can be a little bit of a challenge. So don't, don't give up right away. Give things a chance. Um, it could take three to five times for some of those procedures and routines to really stick. Um, consistency is the key. Don't give up. Um, just keep going with it for a little bit. But if you've attempted things over a longer period of time and they're really still not working, you may need to revamp some things. You may not need to throw it all out, but you may need to make some minor tweaks to it. Um, one of the common things that people do with that is seating charts. So maybe the seating chart you started out with at the beginning of the year is not working because this person and this person should not sit by each other. So you've learned that and now you can make some adjustments once you've gotten to know those students and their personalities. The same thing is true for a lot of other procedures and routines. So maybe how students are checking out books or how they're bringing into the library or how they're renewing them is just not working for your system and you need to make some minor changes to it. Um, also thinking about that what works for one class may not work for another. So this second grade class does really great with this procedure and the second grade class is really struggling. So maybe you need to make an adjustment for one of those classes based off of the personalities in that or needs of the students in that classroom. Or maybe this worked really well with your ninth graders last year, but not so much with your ninth graders this year. It's a different group of students and maybe you need to think about making some adjustments um, for them. And sometimes a more significant change needs to be made. Maybe we do need to start over and look at things in a different way. And it's a really good time to do that at the start of a new quarter or a new semester. Um, so you can kind of have like that blank slate feeling to it where you're like, okay, we're gonna make some changes. And sometimes it's really good to ask your students if they're old enough to give, um, or you feel like they're able to give you some feedback and say, hey, y'all, this is just not working. We've tried it this way and I'm seeing this is our issue or problem. What do you think that we can do to make it work better for you? And take their feedback and think about it and say, okay, thought about what you said and we're gonna try this and give it a go. So, you know, it may take a little bit of time to make everything come around to where it feels comfortable for all of you. And really don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, if you're struggling with a specific procedure or with a specific class or a student and you just want some feedback, ask someone in your building to come in and help you. Ask a building leader, ask a colleague, ask the school counselor, somebody that you trust to give you some fair feedback and say, you know, I really need another set of eyes on this. I need someone to, um, watch what's happening and give me some advice on maybe some things that I can do. And really the key to that is to have that person come in and then pretend like they're not there. Don't acknowledge their presence. Teach as if they are not in the room. Um, don't adjust anything that you would have done just because there's another set of eyes there because the whole point is that you want their feedback on how a typical day is. And don't stop and say, you know, see, this is what I was talking about. This behavior right here, this is the problem. Again, just kind of pretend like they're not in the room because you want them to have as normal of an experience for the day as you possibly can. Um, and if you ignore them, the students are more likely to ignore them and maybe behave how they would in a normal situation. So if you really get to that point Make sure that you pause and ask for some help. Um, sure that there's someone in your building that would be willing to do that for you. And just really have a plan in place. Um, that's one of the things to, to really think about in the end of it is that you go in with this idea of, 
here's what I can do. Here's the things that I know I'm going to encounter. This is what I think will work for us. Um, and remember that no plan is perfect. <laughs> There's some things that are probably going to evolve over time. And once you have that thoughtfully created plan that offers students a positive learning experience in your school library, you're going to have a much um, easier time understanding how that ebb and flow works for you and your students. Because really the, the goal is to make them like the library, to like coming to library class, to be learning in the library with you. And when you have some of those pieces in place, that can happen. That's everything that I have to share for today. And I am going to ask our guests, I'm unmuting you all. Um, so if you have anything to share or ask, please do so. It sounds like maybe we don't. Um, if you have any questions at all whatsoever, um, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, you can reach me at mrspentland at gmail.com or if you'd like a copy of the article that I wrote that follows a lot of what I shared in the webinar today in Teacher Librarian, you can also email me and I'd be happy to send you a copy of that too. So, that's all I have for today unless there's any questions. Oh, um, does anyone have any policies on food or drinks? Um, is this probably in the elementary library? Okay. Um, typically, what I see in elementary libraries is that there's no food or drink in the library during class time. Um, that may be different during special events. Um, I've seen people have, you know, like popcorn or something like that if they're doing a reading event in the library or some, some kind of special event. But typically, um, we don't see food and drink available in the library. Okay, someone else said that they only allow um, water bottles and they have to be kept on the floor. So that is something that we see in some of our schools is that students are allowed to have water bottles with them, um, but I haven't really seen them bring them to specials before. So I think that would be um, something that you would need to maybe think about with your, um, again, your building procedures on what you think would, would work best for you. Um, suggestions on how to limit talking out of turn. Ooh. I think that's tough for everybody. Um, one of the things that I've read about or that I've seen is to, um, if they're able to, have students write down their questions on a piece of paper or a post-it note so that they can hold on to it till later or the thing that they wanted to share. Um, another thing is to have like students just have their pointer finger up um, if they have something to share and just to wait until they're called on. Um, I'm wondering if this is with younger students or with older students. Because it's from someone in an elementary, younger students. That's really hard. <laughs> Impulse control can sometimes be very difficult for our littles. Um, and I think some of that is just practice. Um, lots and lots of practice on when it's okay to speak um, and share your thoughts and ideas and what is appropriate to share thoughts and ideas. Um, I know like one of the things that we'll talk about with our kindergarten students is that you'll say, okay, does anyone have any questions? And then one of them will say like, I got a new puppy this weekend. That really wasn't a question related to whatever it was that we were talking about. Interesting information, but you pause and say, you know, that 
Um, it's not something that we're talking about right now, but maybe you can share it later. So just having that consistent practice with these are things that we talk about, these are things that we don't, and maybe front loading ahead of time. Um, remember, these are the things that um, we do to take turns to talk. If you want to share something, you raise your hand. Make sure that it's on task with what we're working on. Um, oh, that's a great idea. Someone said that they let kids share whatever they want to the last few minutes while they're in line waiting for their teacher. Great plan. That gives them that opportunity to have some time dedicated to sharing whatever it is that they want to share. And it's a great time to get to know those students while they're waiting in line um, and keeps them maybe a little bit more focused in line because they know they'll have to share it. And maybe just saying, okay, wait, wait until we're lining up to share that thought with me. Um, and that's really, you know, it's just practice um, because they may not be used to having to wait to share their ideas with someone. And one thing to really keep in mind for a lot of your students, whether they're in elementary schools or secondary schools, is that they've probably been sitting for a fairly long time during the day before they get to you or they, you know, they've been doing a lot of sitting. So, and maybe not being able to talk and share their thoughts and ideas. So when they get to you, they're ready. Are ready to share their thoughts and ideas and wiggle a little bit. And um, I think that's a really good way of honoring um, that need in them. One of our elementary teachers did a great job in um, her computer lab. She was getting everyone started for the day and she spent five minutes just letting them share whatever was going on that they wanted to share um, before they got started working. And they had the chance to kind of wiggle a little bit and get their thoughts and ideas out before they had to settle down and get to work. Um, and this was an older class, maybe fifth graders. Um, so there's, there's a way to, to honor that movement. Um, if you're familiar with something called Go Noodle, um, or there's some things on YouTube that as you're transitioning from activity to activity could give students the, the opportunity to get up and move a little bit. Um, might be a good way to get some of that anxiety out um, for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, I see kindergarten specials <laughs> at the end of the day a lot. Um, so that's a hard time of day for everybody, especially when you're first starting out with school and not really sure um, how things go. Um, so giving them that, that chance to move and, and talk can be really helpful. Oh, that's a great idea. Um, someone also said they do a little bit of yoga and other stretching with the little kids to help them get their wiggles out and helps them sit through a story. So letting them do that ahead of time, getting them through some of that. Um, I've seen people do meditative breathing with their students as well, where they do the big deep breaths in and out and they stretch up and breathe in and stretch down and breathe out. So kind of the same thing where it um, really gives them the chance to have some physical movement and focus at the same time. Those are great ideas. All right. Anything else from our folks in the chat? Well, thank you very much for everyone who is able to attend in person. And for those of you who are watching online on YouTube, again, this is a webinar from the Nebraska School Librarians Association. And um, if you have any questions or need any um, links to the article, um, please email me at Mrs. M R S Pentland, P E N T L A N D, at gmail.com.